I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Michael Thompson, who's uh, here from Henderson, Kentucky. And, and Michael Thompson's been in the Google Gadgets ecosystem for a long time. And uh, he, way back when, it was Thumbly and a cute little emoticon, I guess it was called. We had no idea what it was, but it was cute and, and it was weird. And, and we thought, hey, we should see what happens. And that was kind of popular. And 90 gadgets later on the consumer side, three gadget, uh, three gadget ads, and now multiple gadget ad templates. And Michael Thompson is, um, you know, mathematically speaking, uh, the number one gadget in the author in the world. You won't see it in the top authors because he's number one because of his ads, including right now on eBay, which uh, is, you know, up until very recently the number one gadget in the world by traffic. So, anyway, without further ado, I thought I'd introduce uh, Michael Thompson, who, uh, who's I'm told very nervous, but you shouldn't be. This is, you know, these are all your friends, so you know, enjoy. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, that was a great intro. We'll probably go down from there. But, uh, <laughs> presumably, you're listening to this talk because you're interested in Google Gadgets. And so am I. I. I think eventually what, what we call the web will become everybody's file system. And, and what we call browsers will be the shell people use to operate on that file system. And the things we're calling gadgets will overtake, uh, gadgets and other web applications will overtake conventional applications in importance. So I think it's a good thing to be interested in right now. So today particularly, we're going to cover how I got started with gadgets, uh, a few things that were successful, uh, a lot of things that failed, and, and some a few things I've done to try to promote my gadgets. And we'll also talk about those gadget ads for uh, Nissan, eBay, and Target. Uh, let's see, try to get this first slide. This is the thumbly concept that uh, Adam talked about. The way, the way this came about, my, my daughter's an art major, both of them are, and uh, she drew these little you know, faces she was doodling, and I, and I tried to animate it. So if you look at this live, and I'm not sure what's going to happen when we do this, but uh, I'll just try it. I guess if you've seen it, thumbly moves. You can watch the one at the top of the corner, just kind of, and it's, it's uh, probably one of the worst designs in history internally. But it, it is cute. Oh, that didn't start off very well. I won't do that again. Let's see. Back into here. Close that. And we're off again. Okay, so that was the live version. Uh, Thumbly eventually started using too much processor time on the shared server. So this is a picture of Thumbly the day he got evicted from the shared server. We had to move it to a dedicated server. Uh, right now my gadgets and the supporting web websites, those 90 gadgets, use about uh, four gigs of bandwidth every day. At the uh, beginning of the year it was about six gig per day, but I revisited all the gadgets and implemented the new image caching features, all the new caching features I could find. In the, that had come up in the API uh, after the initial launch. And uh, so that saved about two gig per day. Um, hats off to the API team for that one. Gadgets can be really valuable to webmasters um, who want to get additional traffic for their sites. Uh, this next one, this is a Pong game. The Pong, that video game, remember that? That's what got me started in programming. I saw that and I said, I want to learn how to do that. And uh, you can see this a little better. I'll try this. You see, I, I started a uh, scoring contest. Well, that didn't work. I didn't know the laser pointer would do that. Started a high score contest, and uh, even before the contest, it was actually doing pretty well. It was uh, the number my number one gadget for a while, and it uh, kind of hovers around the top five right now. Uh, the first contest prize in 2006 was this robot arm. It cost me about 50 bucks. And uh, I was surprised people were competing for it and so forth. Uh, the contest ran all year, and in about December, I started to realize that uh, it depends on where the winner lives, how much it's going to cost to ship this thing. And uh, 
So I started looking at the IP addresses of, of you know, that were logged with the scores. And there wasn't a single U.S. address in the top five. There was, there was one guy over in, or gal or whatever, over in Chicago that looked like they had a chance. So I was ready to go, Chicago. Come on, Chicago. You know? And uh, you can see here the winner was in Italy. And uh, so, so my $50 prize, I had to add $65 to ship it over, and then $100 value added tax. So, so. Uh, Oops, this, this year the uh, contest prize is, uh, I think you can see it on that, on that slide back here, some gift certificates that, that can be emailed. <laughs> uh, this next gadget, this is a surprise hit for me. Uh, it's today in history. What a, the way that came about, it, if you've been around a long time, you remember on the Unix systems, there's a date, tag, list of events that system administrators used to use to add a little interest to the message of the day. People would log in and would say, uh, system going down at 9 o'clock tonight for backup. And, uh, and they could also add these little entries. You know, like today in history this happened. So, and there was also a much longer list of events that used to float around in the news groups. Uh, back when news groups were really about all there was to the internet. And so I put those two lists together. And uh, a few weeks after I submitted that, I saw thousands of people were looking at it. So, so uh, I, be I began to watch things a lot more carefully, and I realized there were a lot of factual errors in those common lists that I started working with. So after that, I, I budgeted roughly about an hour a day uh, for a year to go through, and I, and I made thousands of corrections. And, uh, some items I had to eliminate altogether. And I also added things as it would happen, like Katrina, or when Steve Irwin got, got killed in that freak accident. And then in the help section of the gadget, I invited users to help me find typographical errors or duplications or factual errors. And, and most people that responded to that were really kind and encouraging. Some of them uh, weren't. I'd get messages that I think they were using this template I say you are obviously, you know, check a political party or religion supporter, detractor. You should get a brain or die a thousand deaths. It depends on their stance on different things. So, I, so I get a lot of those. And uh, I also made a version of, I ported a version to uh, suitable for the iPhone, which is is just trivial to do. It just takes moments. And uh, a few days later, I got an email from Apple saying, you know, who, who published that today in history app? And uh, I thought, oh, they're going to sue me. They're going to sue me. What did I do? And uh, it turned out they just liked it. And uh, they wanted me to submit it to their directory and, and make some more. And I, I might do it again later if I, if I decide I'm interested. I don't know yet. Um, the Today in History gadget now is almost fully automated. Uh, what I did is I picked out uh, about four news feeds. And I, I get the top five headlines at the end of the day, what I call the end of the day, from, from each of these new f news feeds. There's one in, uh, of course, the US and uh, India, China. I've got the BBC, Australia. And I, I just save those top five headlines. And then one year later, I add those to the bottom of the Today in History list for that date. So it's almost fully automated. I have to kind of look at it. Sometimes it will say something that's really not, really doesn't make sense in that context. I was very careful to read the terms of service for the feeds I used, you know, hoping, okay, it doesn't look like they're going to sue me for doing this. Uh, been very careful about that. At, at one point, uh, one of my top gadgets was uh, uh, Magic 8-Ball, Virtual Magic 8-Ball. Always wanted one of those when I was a kid. I never got one. So when I learned how to make a JavaScript program, I made a Virtual Magic 8-Ball. I should be saying right now, Magic 8-Ball, trademark Mattel. And, uh, but uh, one day, it suddenly dropped off the Google page like somebody hit a switch. And I started look, searching around, and, and I saw people blogging where they'd gotten uh, cease and desist letters from Mattel. So I, I guess it turned out, I guessed, and I was correct, that mine was a victim too. So I made the amazing crystal ball instead. And <laughs> it, had, it has about 10,000 users again. Uh, on September 6th of this year, I just like suddenly, this gadget shot up by a factor of 10 in the number of, of new uh, installations each day. I don't know why. Uh, 
I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, whenever I go search for it, uh, the only way I can find it is if I search for it explicitly. You know, where I, I know I know what, exactly what to search for, but I don't find any references to it. It's hard for me to find it in the directory because there's some kind of cookie thing or saying, oh, he's already got it or he's had it before, don't show it to him again, or I don't know exactly how that works. Uh, I had theories about the start of the school year, or angular deflection on the moon, I, I don't know. And uh, my guess, best guess at this point, it has crawled to the top of a heap somewhere. I, I, I wish I knew which heap it was. Uh, it's continued to climb, and, and right now it's doing about 20 times more new installations each day than it was during the March-September baseline. Uh, it's a, it's a canvas-based gadget. Everybody familiar with the canvas tag and HTML? Have you ever used it? Probably nobody uses it. It's terrific. I mean, in live, and if I, if I do the live thing again, I don't know what's going to happen. Let me try to do it in a little more gentle way here. Let's see. There. You see how they, you know, they kind of rotate around? Um, over the last week, this is unbelievable, but a science teacher contacted me and he, he was asking questions about it. I told him, you know, it's probably really not suitable for use in education. So he said, okay, we'll fix that. You know, he, and he started helping me with like little details like Kepler's law and, and stuff about astronomy I had no idea about. Uh, so that's been nice. And I think if I, if I kill this, will I go back to the presentation? No, okay. It was worth a shot. We're there, okay. So, uh, I use some of my own metrics to try to tell, I don't know if you can see that very well or not. So you can see the solar system there blowing the curve, and what this is, is it's a pretty good indication, it's not a perfect indication, but a pretty decent indication of the first time somebody installed this gadget. And, uh, and then I can look at Google an Analytics and see how, what the, keep rate, you know, how many people are actually keeping it. Like say if I see it going up, you know, whatever it is, two or three hundred a day, and then in Google Analytics I see it maybe half that or two thirds of that, I know kind of what reaction, maybe it's just a novelty, they try it, they don't like it, get rid of it. But you know, there is some continuous growth. And uh, the other thing you can see is, is that uh, about, uh, you know, the, first three or four gadgets are more popular than all the other gadgets combined. So since since uh, most of my work would be considered unsuccessful efforts, we probably ought to talk about those. Here's a quick look though at the at the Google Analytics. You guys all know you invented this, so you've seen it. And you can see here's a little different picture of the Today in History one's the one that blows the curve here. Uh, this gadget coming up next, I was very enthusiastic about. I'm, I'm not going to touch the laser pointer because bad things might happen. But, but you see the shadow of the shuttle there? I thought that was really cool. <laughs> what you can do is with GMAPs, you use the cursor keys and you can navigate around the globe. You know, and the map just scrolls underneath you. And uh, it has designed into it a little mission brief and about 20 missions. You know, like go to Perth, Australia. And, wait for an upload and then go back to Houston. And uh, so I thought, man, this is going to be great. You fly the shuttle, uh, you play with Google Maps, and you learn some geography. You know, which, which way is Perth, Australia? That way, I think. And out of, out of two or three hundred million people that might possibly look at it, uh, you can see 105 users agree with me. That's really great. This one also got a response. I'm not kidding. I'm not making it up from NASA. And, uh, well, actually, it was just a brief series of emails from a rather perturbed gentleman who works in some dark corner of the Jet Propulsion Lab, and he wanted me to know, in no uncertain terms, that the real space shuttle does not make sharp turns like that, nor can it hover over a city, and he, he gave me several other reasons why I'm just no good. So, so this is another gadget. Uh, oh, excuse me, I missed that one. That one I have a, a big uh, warm up. This next gadget, it has excitement, danger, romance, a 60 second game clock, and less than 100 users. 
probably worked about two weeks to make that happen. Uh, this next one, I worked on it about 10 days, I think, but it, I, I know I spent three months just picturing in my mind, how, how do I do this? How do I make this work? And if, I think if I'd had this one in the directory like in December of 2005, it would have really, it would have really taken off. It's, it's like a persistent scratch pad. And uh, what you do is you can pick a color, and then you take your mouse and drag it around in the little work area, and it remembers what you drew. And if you want to, you can, you can give yourself a, a nickname and, and hit submit, and it shows up on this web page. This is actually a screenshot of a website where people have, have submitted different ones. You can see I drew Snoopy. And uh, let's see. I thought it was a neat, a neat idea, and it was well executed and everything. And this, this pretty, sum, pretty well sums up the response of the community here. So that's, <laughs> that's enough of that. Uh, I get lots of emails about gadgets. Uh, this fall I started getting, maybe back in the summer, I started getting messages from people with these elaborate plans. And they had one thing in common. They all started out, have you heard about the Google Grants for Gadget Development? We noticed you have several gadgets that would qualify. And as I considered these these spectacular sounding offers, I, I tried to imagine Google handing money over to improve the amazing crystal ball. You know, and I, I thought, okay, there it is. Um, what would I do with the money? What am, what am I going to say? Okay, I'm going to hire somebody to convert the predictions into haiku. Or, uh, I'm going to hire Nostradamus as a consultant. Well, the ghost of Nostradamus. So we'll have better predictions. You know, I, I, was, I just can't see it. So mo most of those uh, I don't bother to respond to. Uh, I also, I have one gadget that gets really hot in October and November. It's a haunted house. And it has uh, ghosts and spooky sound effects. And uh, I got a series of emails about that one. An individual wrote that he could hear the spooky sound effects even after deleting the gadget. <laughs> and he, well, I'm not kidding. He, he also posted it as a comment. Here, could not stop the sound even after I deleted the gadget. Well, that, that seriously, that worried me because, you know, I, I call those sound effects with a timer and I don't use sound files that often, so I probably really don't know what I'm doing. And so maybe something I'm doing is bad. So I wrote him back to find out more about the circumstances and he, he told me that he could still hear the sound effects after deleting the gadget, restarting his browser, and rebooting his computer. <laughs> so at that point, I, I was really tempted, you know, like, Dear sir, we re regret to inform you that your PC is now really haunted. It's a, it's a, it's a known issue with the haunted house gadget. And uh, the, the recommended workaround is you douse it with holy water. And, uh, but I, I passed on that one. Can you imagine the, the, the consequences? There'd be a link on Dig to a YouTube video of this house fire related to a Google gadget. You know? So uh, I, took the, I took the high road. and reported it to a friend at, here at Google, with, along with this, my source code to say, tell me if I did something wrong. And, uh, there's, a, there's another individual on the, that likes to, he's very concerned about the quality of, ex, uh, quality of experience for the Google Gadget users. I, I know he is because he's diligently posted a comment similar to this one on any gadget I have that has more than a few thousand users. Uh, looks like the name of the site where you get the higher quality experiences came out blurry on this slide. A little too bad. So, uh, as you know, uh, gadgets are now being deployed as ads. Uh, I'm told this one for a while was getting more views than any other gadget in the world, so I guess that meant it continued to work for a while. Uh, the way that came about is a lot of people here at Google and people at eBay combined their ingenuity and expertise to make that happen. So all I really had to do was listen really carefully and try to understand what they were telling me, which wasn't always easy, and uh, then express that as a gadget. And one thing I do like about this design is that a single source file is producing these different shapes. Um, one, you know, uh, I really have to have things simplified. If, if, if the project was, you know, create a separate source file for each shape, then every time somebody came up with a new idea or an improvement, I would have had to implement it correctly, you know, three or four times. And if you talk to any of the people that worked with me on this, they would tell you that often it took me several tries to get something right one time. So if you can imagine, uh, the simpler the better. And then this ad can, uh, 
accept a keyword for querying the eBay back end, or you can use the site. Uh, it's on to fetch a, a content-related keyword. I, I didn't invent that, but I thought it was a good idea. You can do that. Uh, one of the first test sites was uh, one of those sites where they show pictures of celebrities in embarrassing situations. And uh, we were testing this, and the first time I saw the gadget live, it was adjacent to this candid photo of some poor young lady uh, in a bikini trying to climb into a speedboat. And I thought, well, I finally crossed over to the dark side. And, but I guess if we can produce a useful ad in, in that uh, context, it'll work just about anywhere. The uh, next ad, the target ad, got the benefit of all the, uh, everything learned the hard way on the eBay ad. So the development time on this was about one quarter of what it was on the eBay ad. And the design's a little different. The eBay ad has the search box as a last resort if it couldn't find any appropriate items to list. This one has uh, the search box in, in all instances. Uh, here in this case, a single source file is producing seven different sizes. If the user mouses over a listing, it, it uh, changes that image to the right accordingly, you know, to match the one he's moused over. It, uh, it can pick a keyword from a list in an external uh, XML file. It also, if, if they wanted it to, it could display, if it didn't find any appropriate listings, it could play a target video. Uh, it's also skinned, so that, that background image, like you can see, this tower on the right has a little holly around it. In other words, it's, it's using that, you can just replace that image, it will, as long as you respect the... Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, as long as you can uh, respect the location of the search box and, and the logo at the top, it works fine. So, one of the guys I work with knows where I'm at. They kind of cover my back while I'm doing this. Uh, this is the Nissan ad uh, for one of Nissan's cars, and it starts off with the G map showing kind of an inviting zip code box, and uh, so someone can see the current traffic conditions in their area, which is pretty to me. That's pretty decent if that's all I did. Uh, but then you can also explore the interior of the car. I think this what's on this next slide. Uh, you can drag the image around, you, there's six hot spots. Uh, you can zoom in, zoom out. There on the, on the bottom there, that's my favorite, the one of the skyline. Uh, it's the most richly interactive gadget I've had the pleasure of developing. But you can maybe, you know, consider the list of requirements. He said, you know, in three shapes, banner, tail, and rectangle, and also as a home page gadget, toggle between a slightly hacked version of uh, G Maps and images of the interior of a car, detect which of the four different ad groups and three different sizes the given instance of the ad is running in, report all exits and some interactions by calling the appropriate corresponding double-click URL. While inside the car, the user will be zooming in or out, and dragging and dropping the background. And, uh, <laughs> thanks, Adam. And uh, so the hotspots have to stay right. Uh, don't let any of those hotspot callouts obscure the logo or the exterior shot of the car. And while you're at it, we're eight weeks late, over budget, and make the images of that car crisp. Hurry up. <laughs> you know, so, so now you might understand why my favorite view is the skyline. And, uh, but actually, I was able to use just a, kind of a straightforward set of arrays to handle the whole thing in that one source file. And, uh, one last topic for me, and then I guess there's going to be plenty of time for questions, I assume. Uh, these are some examples of templates I've been given the opportunity to work on. And uh, they're currently, these source files for these are struggling to survive the strictest code review in the history of mankind. <laughs> just, just kidding. There was, actually was a stricter review. Nobody would believe you. <laughs> no, there actually was one stricter review, but... It, that one doesn't really count because the, develop, the, the developer just jumped out a window and they used his code as was. You know, so, and, uh, but I think now I understand why there's no really tall buildings on the Google campus. The, uh, I, think, I think the templates are a great idea and it's an important next step for the gadget ads. Because, at least in my opinion, this gives a, a way for small, mid-sized companies that 
couldn't pony up a big development, uh, upfront development cost or wouldn't take a chance on it, it gives them a way to kind of ease into it real fast. And if they give good results, you know, for example, I mean, a lot of companies are going to be glad to have a quick, easy way to get a coupon out there. They just fill in the blank and I get a coupon with my logo on it. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. So I think uh, unless you have something like that, like the templates, the, it'll be hard for gadgets as to ever get out of what you might call like the novelty stage. Uh, this way is something everybody will be interested in. And at, at this point, I, I wish I had a really profound conclusion for everyone, but uh, I think the most welcome words at this point is that's all I have to say. Do you have any questions? Uh, It's okay if you don't. <laughs> what would you say is the biggest thing that motivates you to develop more gadgets of the, the fun variety? The, okay, well, I'm supposed to repeat the question. The biggest thing that motivates me to write more gadgets? Uh, uh, like, no, there's not just one thing. Uh, a lot of this work I did to try to impress my daughter. You know, like I tried to impress her with Thumbly. And, and if I work really hard, like three months, I can. I can impress her for like two minutes. <laughs> That's, that's part of it. The other thing I found out really fast was that uh, for as I have some mildly popular websites. I mean, it's so mildly popular that you've never seen them or heard of them, but, but these actually drive traffic to those websites. And, and you know, once you're at the website, you can have a nice little AdSense ad there, and somebody might. It could happen. They could click on it. You know? so, so that's part of it. And, and it, uh, the other part is just me personally. I have to have a challenge. I have to have something occupying my mind. If I, you know, won the lottery and bought a, an island in the South Pacific, I would be bored out of my mind after about four hours. I'd have to go create a problem, you know. Let's catalog, catalog all the invertebrates in the lagoon, you know, or something like that. <laughs> I have to have that challenge. And these are kind of a fun challenge. In my day job, uh, this, is, this is my hobby, okay. My day job, uh, I write software for industrial equipment. And then the equipment is, uh, is huge. It's like three stories tall. And it has hundreds of tons of lockup force. It has molten aluminum in, in, in it. And it has this cylinder that takes off like a rocket with, with, with uh, 3,000 pounds per square inch of pressure. And it's going like as fast as a bullet. And there's people around this thing. And I've got software communicating with that. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's not exactly terrifying all the time, but a lot of times, you know, if I make a mistake, if I make the wrong kind of mistake, somebody could really get hurt. If I make a mistake here, somebody, oh, you know, this doesn't look right in Safari. Okay. <laughs> no, it's yeah. I can fix that. Nobody's face got blown off. We're good. You know? you know, so, so it's really, it's kind of a, uh, a very relaxing sort of thing. And, and also it turns out, you know, I'm, I'm not that bad at it. You know, except for code reviews, everything. You know. <laughs> but uh, so. How do you test your methods, and what is the most time-consuming part of the writing? On the on the consumer gadgets, you know, just the ones in the directory. Well, I just test it to satisfy myself. I try all the different features that I designed for it. If it works, and try to make sure I have no JavaScript errors. The uh, let me show you one thing if I can. I don't know if it's gonna. Uh, I think it's okay to, to look at this. Uh, this is a, a test harness that I made when we were trying to figure out the uh, uh, target or uh, eBay ad. Excuse me. Let, me. let me start there. Go to eBay and. I've got a version of it here. So what what we did, what would happen is, uh, they'd give me a, a new, uh, excuse me. something new, like we have to log some new information we didn't have to log before. And it would have some kind of unintended, uh, I'm trying to maximize that, but that's max. It would have some kind of unintended side effect because I, I, I wouldn't remember to test it in all cases. So what we did is I is, uh, made a, uh, a script that would read comments embedded in the gadget source file. And, and for example, in this one, 
uh, you can see, you know, I have a, uh, like, what happens when the search description is of a certain case? And for some reason, I'm not doing this exactly right. I'm kind of nervous, I guess, still. But, but these are the different test cases. And the idea is, is that given all these scenarios, it still needs to look right. You know, there was a bad site, no site, a malformed site, no token, no user, too few results, minimum number of results, uh, and so forth. All these different test cases. So every time we make a change, before I would send it off to Adam and say, okay, here it is, I had to just, uh, for, our, for all of our benefits, is run it through this again and make sure it would pass all those tests that we knew about. And then later on, maybe, uh, it's hard to think of an example right now, but, it, but at various times we would add to these tests, like something would happen, we'd find a bug. So we would add that to the test. So it's kind of reactive. I don't know if I answered your question satisfactorily or not. Most time of the testing? Oh. Well, the most time consuming part, honestly for me in general, most of my gadgets is thinking ahead of time of what the design is going to be like. For all the consumer gadgets like the solar system and, and uh, today in history, I, I, in each case probably I spent a lot more time thinking ahead of how is this going to look or how is this going to work? How am I going to implement it? That's where all the time was. And then when it actually came time for coding, it's maybe this short. So maybe I thought about it. planning, maybe is a better word. I plan this long and, and have this much time for coding. And maybe the testing goes on until the last user is dead. <laughs> right? <laughs> OK, so. Um, so I don't, um, you built so many gadgets, and I'm curious like how how usually you find the current set of API libraries that you have on there for gadgets? And if, if there's like something that you wish to see, like what, what is that? Okay, useful things about the API gadget library and things I would wish I would like to see. Uh, for me, it is probably not what you're looking for, but for me, it would be almost a, at the top of the page when I go to the API documentation, it would be like a, a little box with a screen and said, here's a log of the last 15 changes we've made. This is the date, this is the change. And it was just one sentence. You know, or like an XML feed that I could have a little gadget and say, and I can see, oh, hey, we made a change, we made a change, different things like that. It, it, to be honest, it's, it's a very rare occurrence, but it has happened where some change in the API caused the gadget to throw an error. You know, and, and for a gadget developer like me, I mean, you know, I, maybe I, I finished that one four months ago, I, you know, I tested it, it worked then, and now all of a sudden I'm getting emails that it's not working, or I see the number of installations plummeting. You know, something's wrong, and I don't know what. So it's kind of like an earthquake. You know, what happened? And uh, so that would be the, the, the first one. And uh, but but in general, everything I've seen you guys do in the API is just it just keeps getting better and better. I thought the caching was great. You know, I, I still think I, I won't do it because I'm about to always use my powers for good. But somebody will use that to make the Google file system. You know, seriously, you could. I've thought about how you would do it. And, uh, but if you, that caching idea, that was terrific. And uh, uh, that's probably been the biggest help to me overall. I think uh, one, one area for improvement is, is, I don't do it much, but some people handle flash files and it's not quite smooth yet exactly how you do that, how you wrap the JavaScript around that, that flash, unless, unless you're just gonna show somebody a YouTube video with the default YouTube player, and then it's pretty straightforward. But if you get outside of that, it gets really difficult. Do you make much use of the gadget directory? And either way, what, what suggestions or what features would you like to have for it? Uh, how much use do I make of the gadget directory? And do I have any feature suggestions for it? Uh, I probably look at the gadget directory once or twice a, a day. It just depends on, on what I'm thinking about. Sometimes I'll have an idea for a gadget, one of the first things, when I have this idea, one of the first things I do is go look to see if somebody's already done it. Most of the time they have. You know, or something so close to it that I don't want to bother. Sometimes I don't care, I don't think, you know, they didn't do that very well, my idea is going to be great. You know? And I get 100 users. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, uh, the comments really bother me. 
sometimes. There's sometimes there's vulgarity in the comments, and, and I'm doing, you know, my daughter, okay, she's 18, the oldest one's 21. Yeah, they've seen it, and they've heard it and all that. But if I could have it so I could show them stuff and not worry about them seeing that, I'd like that. And I, I've reported a few comments, and, and I've had kind of mixed results. Sometimes, you know, they, yeah, they were gone, and then sometimes I never heard anything, and so I don't know. <coughs> But and I, how can you control it? You know, I mean, it's like well, people are going to write stuff on the wall. They're going to spray paint the, you know, the buildings outside, and they're going to put stupid comments onto the gadgets. If they if you make a comment, somebody will do something stupid. So what can you do? You know, but I think uh, one of the things I, I wondered when you first started was how are you going to handle it? Because I'm making more and more gadgets, and that list is getting long, and other people are going to make more gadgets than I am. And I thought it, it was really handled well the way you showed, like, the top four or five gadgets and, and whatever, however many more, 16 more, you know, where you could open that up. So it, it really compacted the, the directory. I thought that helped. So. And, and the, the last suggestion I have would be to check for author, Michael, at michaelthompson.org. Go ahead and put that at the top. <laughs> you asked, you know, so. <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, persistence, some kind of persistence, and and you you started that you've got that dot set. When you very first started, you didn't have any way for us to do anything persistently. Now some of the things I do, uh, like the high score in the palm game. Okay, I have to log that on my own server. If there was some safe way for me and the user where I could save their high score for them, and it really wasn't subject to somebody saying, "Oh, here's the URL. I'll just change it." I have a eight thousand now on palm. You know. So some safe way for me to, to have some persistent data. I know the challenge is that uh, you know you, you, Google has such a tremendous respect for people's privacy, and you're not going to do anything to jeopardize that, or even give the appearance of jeopardizing that. So so probably it makes persistence harder. But but that would be the thing. Uh, if you let me point to a log of, of high scores or different things like that, things that I'm doing directly on the server, that would be a big deal. Yeah, I was going to ask you about how much volume of like email feedback you usually get from users. Like now that you have so many gadgets, I imagine each one you start to get more. I probably and it almost becomes like a part-time job. But um, and how much impact do you think it has to actually like uh, take some of the users' feedback into the context and actually you know implement like the request that they send in and stuff like that? Um, like, the, is there a correlation between that and the number of users you get? Like the increase in the page rate? Yes, there is. The question was, uh, how do I get a lot of email? Is it helpful? And, and is there a correlation between the number of people using the gadget and the email I get? And, and the answer, uh, it, it depends. Like if, if, we, if there's a surge of that uh, temporary unavailable, you know, that goes on for, for six or eight hours, I'll start to get a lot of messages. Where's Thumbly? Where's Palm? You know, you're no good because it's gone. You know? and, and, uh, that's that's one of the top ones, and and when it if I get like one or two, I don't really say anything. But if I start to see a pattern, I've got like this many in the inbox. You know, I've, I've been sending an email off to Google saying, just in case it helps anybody to know, this is what I'm saying. Uh, things like on some gadgets, like the Today in History, uh, I, when somebody points out a typo or a factual error or whatever that helps, I add their name to the credits, not their email address but just their name, you know, whatever they gave me, you know, and, and people seem to respond well to that. You know, I notice people give me two or three things. Well, what would we do? We'll put a star beside my name if I give you three? You know, I don't know. And uh, uh, the, it, it is kind of funny, like, for example, on recipe of the day, that has the highest number of, recipe of the moment that has the highest number of users. I don't get any email about that. There's no comments. There's not one rating. Okay, and then I get most of the comments about anything that's a game. You know, when people say, "Oh, you know, ooh, this sucks. Go to World of Warcraft," <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and uh, you know, so, you know, those I consider those not. You know, but, but the gentleman that contacted me about the solar system gadget, you know, he, said, he was asking questions. And I said, "You know, I wouldn't use this in education as it is." And he said, "Okay, let's let's go." You know, and, and uh, so I'm going to credit him in the help file, and 
you know, he really worked hard on it. You know, he's, he's given me diagrams and explained the, which moons of Jupiter go clockwise and which ones go counterclockwise and, and really digging into it is great. And I, I don't know what will happen with it. I don't know if it will show up in some eighth grade science class, but would that be neat if it did? You know, if it would really help somebody, that would be nice. Uh, lessons learned creating gadgets for advertisements, right? The, uh, the tolerance on what you see is plus or minus zero pixels. I, I learned that. Uh, I learned that, the, I don't know if I should say this, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Uh, a lot of times the people, and it's not just true in this industry, but a lot of times the people who make decisions about what happened are the people who don't know actually how to do anything. And they really don't know how to do anything. And there's no other job for them in the company but to decide what we're going to do this today or that. You know, so uh, you know, so there's a lot of uninformed decisions made, or or people come at things and they have really no idea. You know, if you start talking about a URL, they say, "Oh, no, wait, don't get all technical on me." <laughs> I'm not making that up. I mean, I, I really got that response. You know, and I, I notice sometimes. And I think I kind of have an advantage. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm one of the older gentlemen, and uh, I've been, I've worked in sales, I've worked in cost estimating, I've done, you know, I've had a lot of jobs. Finally, found one I could do. And uh, one of the things I've learned with is how to talk to customers. You know, for, you know, this is something else I probably shouldn't say, but to me, customers are kind of like babies. You know, they cry, they get wet. You got to powder them a little bit, get them a diaper. You know, you just have to be super patient. You can't be too patient. Gosh, I hope my girlfriend doesn't show up on this. <laughs> oh, <here> she is. <laughs> okay. Uh, she was mad that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so so you know, you just have to be very patient and accept them. You know, I have to accept the customer where, wherever they are mentally. You know, and and I have to communicate with them however they want to communicate. And then sometimes that means. They want to burn four or five days between email messages, you know, or they don't want to get on Gmail and use that handy little chat, or they, they want to take two weeks, I'm not making it up, two weeks to schedule one phone call. Talk about somebody has got some time in their timeline. A scheduled phone call, two weeks. Can you see that on the chart? Good gosh. You know, so you just really have to be patient with customers and because, because really you're on the same team. I mean, both of you want to make money, right? Both of you want to make, have be successful. Both want to go home and say, "Man, I did great today," you know. So, so really, you, you, for me, I, I keep looking for how can I make this a win-win situation? How can we both come out? All of us come out winners. So, anything I touch, that's that's how I approach it. You know, and, and so I'm a, like I say, a big lesson for me really was plus or minus one pixel. And, and also, I don't know what crisp means. If somebody says that image is not just not crisp enough, I'm dead. <laughs> I am, you know. I talked I talk to someone who works in advertising, and I was telling him that story. He was really a nice gentleman. I mean, and uh, he, he said, you know, I know exactly what they were talking about. He says it means to take a, a kind of a low-resolution image and make it look better. Maybe you give it a little more white, you know, and you, and you kind of trim the edges a little better with it, maybe jagged, and those kinds of things. So he knew exactly what they meant. But in, in that case, in that instance, I didn't know how to do it. And I, we kind, I kind of put the ball in their court, I said, I I'm sorry. I don't think I can understand what you're asking for in time to do this. Or even if I do understand it, I may not have the capability. So you guys have this art department. Let me give you the individual images. Make them however you want. And we'll stick them right in the gadget. You know? And they were real happy about that. It's like their destiny was in their hands, you know. And, uh, you know, I didn't drag it on and pretend I knew what they were talking about or try two or three things. It would have just made it worse. You know, so, but, but I actually like working with people, and, and you know what? I've had some of the best results with the people who started out being the most difficult. You know, the, in, in, uh, in industrial manufacturing, you run into a table pounders. You know, they pound the table and they get all mad and everything. And if you ever run into a table pounder, maybe if you just reach over, pat them on the shoulder, say, 
I like a tough guy. You know, and make them laugh a little bit, and you can win. You know. So. I'm wondering if you have any ideas or wishes for how uh, Gadget interacts with a container. For instance, right now, if you click on a link, you're basically going to open up in a new window. Would, do you have any ideas for it opening up in, this, in an expanded view in the same container? And also for gadgets to sort of grow out of their limitation right now, which is the small size of most of the containers that they're on. You know, that, that's a, to me, that, two, two things. Was, was, the question was, what do I think about uh, being able to expand the size of the container? of the gadget, and, uh, or maybe something different happens other than going to open a new site when I click on a link in a gadget. And, and uh, you know, if you think about it, since 2005, you know, one or two gadgets, have, uh, however often, whatever pattern I've, I've been making, I've always thought about I'm, I'm in a square this big. So I haven't really had time to absorb what happens if you, if you uh, really expand. Uh, I do have one gadget that's a maze, and I use the standard uh, open source maze generating algorithm to create the maze. And I just went ahead and said, you know, in whatever space you have, right? So it, it uses the, that canvas tag, and uh, which you can draw on just like a bitmap. You know, you give it x, y coordinates, plot an arc, whatever you want to do. And uh, so uh, just playing around with that one, if you expand it, what happens is you get a more complicated maze. You know, it gets bigger. So in that case, the gosh, that would be that one would be great. On the other hand, as a webmaster, when they click on something, sometimes I want them to go to my site and accidentally click on my AdSense ad. Maybe, you know. So I don't necessarily want to just keep them trapped in the in the gadget. But I, I think that's something a, a lot of gadget authors are going to, if that happened, would have to give it a whole lot of thought. And you know, maybe maybe a lot of the others would be a lot smarter than me, and they'd have like suddenly, oh yeah, I can do this now, I can do that. But right now, I I'm just kind of boggled by it. I don't know what would happen. It's, I don't think it's bad, but you know, it opens up a lot of new possibilities. That's almost always good. Oh, so one of the things we uh, um, talked about yesterday was some of the problems that you've had in authoring gadgets, particularly layout um, with gadget ads, and uh, I wondered if you'd mind sharing that with you, the group. Uh, the question of problems with gadget ads, if I can go back to that, I'll just show you just kind of a learning thing. Like, like the first one we uh, really spent the most time on was this eBay ad. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to give it a keyword. Like, uh, yeah. Gmail. Let's see if there's any Gmail accounts on for sale on eBay. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. 99 cents, I can get one. <laughs> okay, the, the layout of this one, now this is the banner. And, and obviously in a, in a rectangle, you can imagine what we, what the design called for was pull that list underneath the, uh, underneath the logo in that image. And, and on the tower, you know, it's had the logo on the top and, and two or three images down the, you know, down the, the tower. So on that one, the approach was uh, embedded in the gadget is uh, some HTML with some, some big obvious tags where you could replace things. You know, kind of a, a baby version of a, something that, you know, like a, you know, a really good template generator, generating system would have. And, uh, the, uh, and, and it works, I think it works effectively. Uh, on the target, let's, let's see, let me go to the next one. Uh, on the target ad, okay, now on that one, um, with something we didn't really have time in the, you know, given the time constraints and all the other things we were trying to do, was, and, but we talked about it on the eBay ad, was just say, okay, let's just, let's just set up some divs and, and look at the ID and, and just do everything as a, as a, like DOM replacement, you know, just, we're just gonna replace. So that one pretty much works that way. And uh, it's skinned, in other words, we just give it this background image and tell the gadget a little bit about, you know, here's, here's where your logo coordinates are, here's your coordinates for the search, and, and that's really all it needs to know. So no matter what shape it is, as long as it has those certain coordinates in an array, it can handle it, right? So, so that design makes the code a lot shorter, okay? Uh, 
So those are the kinds of kind of the thought process we went through. And then, like on the Nissan ad, I'm not kidding. I'm not making it up. The the expectation was that I was going to make a, a set of files with a, a image map for this shape and this shape and this shape. And I would I would have had to uh, I'd still be working on it because my mind just doesn't work that way. And and I really. I'm not good at getting something right here and over here and over here. I'm doing good if I can just get it right in this one spot and then make it figure out how to do these other shapes or whatever. So, uh, you know, I couldn't have, I couldn't really thrive in an environment where I had to have all these separate files for everything. So I was just lucky that JavaScript and, and uh, the object model and all that has a way where you can, you can do it with just one source file. I was wondering if you have any experience with internationalizing your gadgets, trying to make them available to uh, a wider audience. If you do, um, if you have any comments on that experience, any wishes along those lines. Sure. If you don't, uh, you know, or just in case where you haven't internationalized the gadget, maybe why not? I think so. that was a good point. I think I'm going to try something here. Uh, well, when I was first talking to. Uh, Sorry. When uh, we were first, this is the guts of it. When we were, first, the question was about internationalization, and when we first talked about the eBay ad, uh, the individual at Google that was contacting me about it is one of those far-sighted people who tries to think of everything. And he was talking on the phone, and the information was coming really fast. And he said, "Okay, we have some I8, I8n issues," and I'm like on Google, I8n, yeah, yeah, okay, I can do that. <laughs> and and uh, but but. Because one of the things I figured out we could do, I'm going to pull this up here now. I had everything I was going to say on my talk. Oh, uh, everything I was going to say on, on my talk on paper up here, so that's why I had the computer down below. But uh, so, uh, we, one of the things we thought about, gosh, I can hope I'm find this again because that's not the right place. One of the things we thought about was. Uh, the different currency symbols. And maybe an old version. I was just going to show you the script, but, but to answer your question, basically what we did was was uh, put in an algorithm that you know uh, I looked up the different rules for displaying the formats of currency, and just put in an algorithm that could could handle that. And we gave it some rules like does it use a comma or a decimal point? Uh, is it you know from the right to left or left to right? Uh, there were, there were some surprising things, you know, about different ways the world displays currency and the different little punctuation marks they use. So in the algorithm, we just replaced, you know, I just started off thinking, okay, how do we do it? And, and <coughs> laid that pattern out and then used an array of currency symbols. Okay, this is U.S., so the dollar sign goes here. Okay, this is the British pound, so that means the dollar sign, uh, pound sign goes there, and so on. And for the numbers format, it was a little bit different, you know, whether they use commas, how many places after the decimal place, some are one, some are two, and so forth. So, so the way I handled it was to make a little algorithm to, you know, given an amount and which of these six or eight different ones we put in, we plugged in there, would, uh, you know, how should that display, given that currency? And it was real easy, and we, we made it a user pref, and, uh, but I don't think anybody ever actually, I don't think they've gotten that far yet. But uh, I tell you what, it's, it's probably going to be a really, uh, you know, that's going to be a really big challenge. It's almost like a gadget per language or whatever, almost, unless you do, do put something in the source code to handle all the cases you want to handle. So. Do you do anything to try to promote your gadgets, or do you find that they mostly just promote the gadgets that you uh, one, of the, one of the things I do, I'll, I'll try to show you in here, uh, talking about promoting gadgets. I lost my mouse. There it is. Uh, one, one of the things I do is I have some gadgets refer to uh -oh, to other gadgets. So like if somebody goes to in the, gosh, this presentation is a wreck. Let me see if I can get cleaned up here. I'll just shoot here as fast as I can. Okay. That's me. <laughs> um, 
So like, we'll go down here, okay, so here's the Christmas calendar. Okay, you remember when you were kids, they, they'd have, some of, some of us had those little uh, cardboard calendars and you peel back one day at a time. Well, that's what this does, you, except it looks at what day it is and you, know, you can't click on 10 yet, it'll say wait till it's on 10. And in the, in the help file, in the help file for, um, for that one, I might be able to show it to you, but uh, in the help file for that one, it talks about another one. It says, if you like this, you might, you might also like the, uh, kind of like these, kind of like the, you might also like the uh, Christmas snow globe. So one, one thing, all my gadgets have a, uh, there it is, here's the Christmas snow globe. And the help file on it talks about the uh, Christmas calendar. And the haunted house gadget talks about the Halloween pumpkin and, and so forth. But today in history, because it's, it gets, uh, seems like the kind of users that are interested in a lot of different things. Let me just go here. Here's, here's a, an instance of today in history. And uh, you see this, uh, is the mouse showing up? Yeah, free software. Okay, there's a random gadget. So I have, you know that, remember we started off with that index of all my gadgets? Well, every time you can click that, it just picks one at random and then invites you to, uh, I'm, okay, I'm not making this up. Uh, somebody that works for me, she, she's a really, used to work for me, really bright developer and, uh, and really sharp. I, I really liked working with her, but she got a better offer and I, I couldn't match it. And I said, I said, is there anything else I can do? Is there anything else I can do? She said, well, I want a pony. So where's her pony? <laughs> she didn't stay. <laughs> um, this is that, uh, let's see, today in history. They, they can also add, you know, like, like right here I could say, uh, so try to do it. they'll never forget this talk. They'll never forget this one. You know, so it'll show up every year on uh, December 10th, or whatever it is. But uh, so that's how I promote gadgets. Point to them from other places, and and most of my gadgets, when I click that, and a lot of surprisingly, it works for the people that do. It's not working for me now. But I'm trying to click that. Maybe something changed in the API. Okay, so <laughs> it goes to this site, and, and here's just showing up. I'll tell you what, my next plan for this is, is you'll be able to put in like, uh, like say today's my birthday, you know, and it'll show up as a history item, Michael Thompson's birthday, in with all these others. And you can kind of decorate the page for yourself and send it around to people for like birthday cards. But anyway, that's my next idea. But you can see like, here's my little live weather gadget. I mean, there's a hundred little live weather gadgets out there. I like mine better, so there it is. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there's the moon. I can go get it from the Navy site, you know, what the phase is. There's the solar system today, and it really looks like that, thanks to the science teacher on the East Coast. And uh, so people come here, uh, and they see these other things. You know, like I think maybe maybe this is where they're finding that solar system gadget. Maybe they say, hey, that's neat, I want that. And then, and then of course, uh, when they come here, uh, they, can see, they can see just about all of them. put my categories on that are correct and uh, <laughs> so that's how to how to promote have you uh, done anything with intergadget communication and what do you think of sort of uh, you know you can share a tab sharing a tab with a whole suite of gadgets that are meant to go together almost like a dashboard or a suite uh, I think it's I think it's a great idea I, I actually did it before there was a good way to do it and uh, it's a very unsuccessful gadget. Uh, actually, here's a couple of them, like the survey gadget. It shares information. Like if I click yes, everybody can see that somebody new clicked yes. You know, across all gadgets, all instances of that gadget. So, uh, Webmasters started entering questions like, isn't this the coolest website? So I gave them their own, where they can just put it on their website. It's got one question, there it is. Uh, another one I did, I had this idea that didn't really take off. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, beacon. Okay, now, now what this is, uh, we can play around with it, but let me show you how, you, you'll probably recognize in just one second why it wasn't that successful. 
but uh, Beacon's designed to let you post a message on your Google homepage that can be seen only by a group of people you select. Okay, so so what I did is I did a, like a public key, private key thing. You know, the private key you need that to change it. Public key you need that to see it. And uh, so so you you see right now I just lost 99 percent of my potential of the, the audience. But but some people actually do use it, and the ones who do use it, they're really proud of it. You know, so so once somebody's figured it out. Uh, they're really happy with it, and and uh, you can uh, kind of the cool thing here. I thought it was cool anyway. Is uh, let's see. Well, it's, it's too hard to configure. But anyway, <laughs> I think I've got a little website about it where I have examples of the kind of things you can do. And you know, like I thought, okay, everybody at Purdue will want to use this. You know, and, and here's how you can say Happy Thanksgiving to your family. And uh, hey, look, I went to Epcot, you know, and those kinds of things. So that was the idea, and, and to me, this did that. But, it, but like I said, it's very, uh, very bad user interface, very difficult to configure, not intuitive at all. I can give you a long list of reasons why, but, but it does work. And, and so, uh, you know, if you guys make a, an easier way for people to do that, you know, it's true. So anybody need a caffeine infusion? Yes, I say we'll just go grab them afterwards. He's yeah. getting home is open. So.